I'm Johnny Engineer Termel, and I'm running in the Toronto Danforth by election, my 76th election Guinness record. And like most by elections and elections, uh, we are invited to the live debates where there are a couple of hundred people, and usually half of them are party clappers who came along to applaud their candidate for the cameras, and only maybe a hundred actual interested voters. But the TV, the major media, where tens of thousands of people get to hear, well, we don't get invited. It's always the same major four parties who get all the time at Rogers, all the time at the Canadian Parliamentary Channel, all the time at TV Ontario. So I taped the TV Ontario show, Steve Pakin's Agenda, and uh, I've titled the video, Steve Pakin's Not All Candidates Debate. And I decided I was going to add commentary through the whole of this half hour and get my two cents in, as well as make fun of my opponents, make fun of Steve for not being too bright and for wasting everybody's time on a show with nothing in it. And, of course, express my resentment at my unsportsmanlike and cheating candidates who take this free time from the crooked moderator and allows them to score all the points while I never got a chance. So yeah, I think they are unsportsmanlike cheats for accepting the unfair advantage, but their teams have always done that. Their teams are unsportsmanlike cheats. NDP, Liberal, Green, Tories, they're all accepting the unfair advantage while smaller parties with new ideas get excluded and that's why you can bet that there's nothing new that's going to come up on today's show steve pakin's not all candidates debate and joining us now on the debate the major party candidates for the toronto danforth by-election in so the major party candidates the guys you hear from all the time and you're going to hear more of nothing new alphabetical order Grant Gordon for the Liberals, Adriana Bonato Hamud for the Greens, and Craig Scott for the NDP. And you'll notice that the Tory didn't show up. The Conservatives are contesting this by-election, but despite repeated efforts on our part to have their candidate here tonight, their campaign hasn't returned our phone calls. We did get one terse email saying they wouldn't be participating, and from what we've heard, they're boycotting all of the candidates' debates. That's them. That takes nothing away from the fact that we're very glad that the three of you accepted our invitation to be here tonight. We're glad to... So, why would they duck the debates? Well, actually, he came to the first debate. And I guess he was ready to handle the accusation that, uh, you know, the robocalls were a horrible crime. But then I did my number on him, calling Harper Canada's first war criminal prime minister for having participated in the attack on Libya, who never did anything to us, and how he was another worse murderer for not having warned the pregnant women in B.C. to get out of the nuclear fallout as the plume was approaching the West Coast from Fukushima. And I was screaming, take cover. So he turned off the fallout machines and baby deaths tripled thanks to Stephen Harper. So I guess after being accused of two genocides, one, you know, war criminal in Libya and one mass murderer in Canada, I guess he didn't want to show up to any more debates. But these are pretty safe because I'm not invited and you can be sure these guys aren't going to talk about the dead babies or the dead Libyans. Do you all around the table. Let's just start, as I suggested in the intro, this, this is a more than average by-election, and we want to put some of the history, if you would, Michael, bring this up, some of the history as to what makes this area of Toronto so interesting. This riding actually was, under a different name, held by the Conservatives from 1935 to 1963. It has not gone Conservative once since 63, almost 50 years. But after that, the New Democrats held it under Bob Ray first, and then Lynn MacDonald, and, of course, I ran in that by-election against Lynn MacDonald in 1982, 30 years ago, when I was offering the Argentine Solution before it was called the Argentine Solution, the idea of paying people with provincial bonds to do stuff. And I brought it to the Broadview Greenwood elected right, election right after being busted in front of the IMF World Bank passing out the bond idea where I hope Argentinians got the idea from. So... I went and ran in the Broadview Greenwood by-election, got no media, nobody knew that they were rejecting the Argentine solution, and that's why it's called the Argentine solution and not the Broadview Greenwood solution. 
And then and Dennis Mills took it for a good chunk of time in the late 80s all the way up until 2004 when, of course, Jack Layton won it for the NDP and became the party leader. Uh, what happened last time? In the federal election back on May the 2nd of last year, Jack Layton won it with 61% of the votes. That's a big lead that the NDP take into this by-election. Andrew Lang was the then liberal candidate with 18%, the conservatives at third, and Adriana, there you were, uh, running last time as well with 6% coming in for the Greens. Now remember, when they have nothing about issues to talk about, all they can talk about is the odds of winning, the chances of winning. Watch, you'll see how much time is spent in discussing their chances of winning. So here's the first question, and let's just go in the order in which they appeared last time. Craig, you first. This riding is accustomed to having some pretty big names representing it, whether it's George Hees for the Conservatives 50 years ago, Jack Layton, Bob Ray. Big names. What makes you think you've got the chops to replace them? Geez, what a question. What a question. Big names? I mean, it should have good policies, not good names. Well, I think my background as a law professor at U of T and then Osgood has prepared me well for it. Um, I feel like I've contributed a lot to society, Canada, and internationally as well. And I can't say much more than that. It's up to the, uh, the electorate to determine whether I have uh, the, the ability. A lot of what I've been trying to do is talk to people at the door and get them to know me as a person. So that's a really important uh, factor as well. Great. How would you answer that? Well, I don't... I guess when you don't have any policies to offer, you got to get to let them know you as a person. Well, yeah, there are some big names, definitely. Was Dennis Mills a big name when he started? I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. But he was a tremendous presence in the riding. And I think what, what uh, people in Toronto Danforth are really looking for is someone who is really connected to the place, knows the place, and can help solve problems. All right, so they need a local boy. I think it's not so much big names as... Uh, Forward thinking. I think the writing is very forward thinking, and I do think it's also very green. Okay, no ideas, no new ideas, but thinking forward. <laughs> Going door to door, it's very clear to me that everybody does really want a green candidate, which is why this whole race has been about who's the most environmental. And it's very clear that the most environmental is a green party, and it, I think this... Pro what does most environmental mean? The person most in favor of doing it the cleanest, even though they don't know how? Biden will, may just elect the second green and double the green power in Parliament because that's what that's what this riding is all about. Your victory would be twice would the number be, of members. Let's face it, my victory would shake up Parliament much more than any of the others. Grant the... <laughs> no ideas, but her victory would shake up Parliament? Imagine my victory. It's the results of the last election, and admittedly you weren't running then, and it's different time today, obviously, than it was uh, almost a year ago when that election was held. But the results suggest you've got a long way to come back. What makes you think you can? All right. How are you going to do in the race? Tough race to come back, eh? You're behind. Well, there was a uh, there was a poll done early on that was much, much similar to this one, the results. Um, and I felt that when I started. I, people didn't recognize me necessarily across the riding. They didn't know me all that well. And I felt the doors at the beginning didn't open very widely or very quickly. And I can feel, this is a little bit like Seabiscuit, um, I can feel every day that goes by the doors are opening wider and wider and I'm getting bigger grins and more interesting conversation. <laughs> it's not grins, they're laughing. Seabiscuit, the odds are getting better, you're telling us? With a silk stocking, former socialist silver spooner, failed leader of the NDP, Bob Ray, leading your party. It's not grins, it's laughing. And I think it's going to turn out to be a really interesting finish. Let's talk about those doors, because I always like to find out. <laughs> Seabiscuit might still win. You guys knock on whatever it is, 10,000 doors during the course of this thing, maybe more. What are you hearing at the doors? Okay, now we're going to spend a whole lot of time, certainly not discussing policies, but what we're hearing at the doors. It's got to explain how they're aware of the problems, which might lead you to conclude they also know what to do about them, since they're so aware of them. Here we go, Boris. I'm hearing mainly uh, two things. One is, uh, Adrian is absolutely correct. It's quite common to end up in conversations about the environment. Sometimes it's local issues, sometimes it's uh, national global warming. 
is brought up a lot. Uh, but beyond that, there's a commonality that many, many people are talking about uh, concerns and, the, and worries, and sometimes more than that, about the Conservative government. And there's something about the riding where I expect my colleagues are hearing things like that too. And the idea of holding Mr. Harper to account, holding his feet to the fire, uh, as one of the functions of an official opposition, uh, people get that, and they get that uh, have the background to help. It's already a really strong. All right, so he's there to hold the prime minister's feet to the fire. Doesn't have any new solutions, new ideas, but he's a good footholder to the fire. Our team up there, we're over 100 MPs uh, who are. Uh, hundred guys holding his feet to the fire for the next uh, three years. What are you hearing at the door? I, I'm not hearing one issue. There's even one galvanizing issue out there. Of course, now he gets to list all the woes he's heard about that he doesn't know what to do anything about. But um, yes, there are there are some kind of macro issues like global warming and robocalls. But when you count the green, who all three of them talk about global warming like it's true, you gotta say, what are these people? Lunatics? Ill-informed? Are they unaware of Climate Gate, where they've admitted that they juggled the figures to make it look like the temperature was going up when it's actually been going down? They used a trick to hide the decline? I've read this. I know there's been a decline. And yet, these three are still talking about global warming. The hoax has been called, and these three are still pushing it, which means their parties probably are too. What I'm really sensing is that families are getting squeezed, and it relates to all kinds of different issues. Um, lack of childcare. So you come across a young family, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they can't find a spot in a daycare. So that's a big issue. And he made a list of all the woes. Uh, family with a, a young person who's coming yes, to college yes, yes. who can't find a job. That family's feeling pressure. Yes. Um, Feeling pressure in a number of ways. This is a very diverse riding. Yeah. So immigration issues, there are tons of cuts happening to, uh, to immigration, to resettlement. English is a second language. So there are a lot of new Canadian families that are... Fi tons of cuts in finance, which, since they don't have any answers, probably won't get discussed in this show tonight. Feeling the squeeze in that respect. So it's just... A lot of different issues, but the squeeze is happening. Small business, the riding's fueled by small business. A lot of people in our riding own small businesses. We should point that out to people who are watching outside Toronto. This is not the part of Toronto with a ton of skyscrapers. There are no skyscrapers yeah. whatsoever. So there are a lot of uh, independent stores, mom and pop shops, throughout the riding, and those people are having a tough time. Yeah. In this economy, you're really hearing environment. And wouldn't it be nice if he knew what to do about the tough times? is the number one issue at the door. Yeah. I'm hearing a lot of things. Um, people are, I mean, tick, yes, tick, they tick. do talk a lot about the environment. They're also talking about being squeezed. They're talking about unemployment. They're talking about the economy. They're talking about... She's aware of the woes, too. A lot. Um, all kinds of things. Yeah. But the economy is, it, sorry, the environment is a very strong thing. I just wanted to, to point out uh, for Craig, who's talking about a strong um, opposition, that... In fact, in this riding, it's very clear that we are going to elect an opposition member. And with the dynamics of Parliament being what it is, it actually doesn't matter which of us gets elected because we all have to work together. And we have to peel some support from the Conservatives, which actually our party's been actually historically good at in other countries, at forming uh, coalitions and, and working with other And also, your policies aren't any different. None of you have any way of creating jobs creating paychecks for jobs. So, uh, yeah, you are all the same whether you get elected. Doesn't really matter. You're all going to fail. <laughs> Parties and, and getting help where it's needed. So actually, in terms of getting things beyond this parliament, our party's pretty good at it. And I would be exceptional in terms of being able to represent this riding, not coming from a big party where I would be forced to uh, to fit into a very hierarchical, rigid, big party structure where I have to vote strictly along party lines and, and speak only when, when my leader lets me. I know my leader very well, and she'll let me speak whenever I want. Right? <laughs> I think it's really important. This is our big issue. The others have hundreds of members, so there will be some party control over them, but my party only has one leader, so I'll be freer to do what? And who, who wins this? 
uh, election because we need a, a really strong local leader, a community builder, but we also have, we need someone who can go to Ottawa. He knows what we need. And rattle Harper's cage, but also perform... Hold his well. feet to the fire, too. And that's a must. We need someone who's really going to stand up for the environment, but have the waste yes, of a... Stand up for the environment. What does that mean? Of a national party behind them, like the Liberals, like Stephen Dion, etc. They might say that a, that a lawyer's best position to do that, this guy over here is a lawyer. It's also the first time the Grants even talked about what can be done in Parliament. <laughs> up until this point, it's all been local, so that's an interesting change in what, message. No, well, that's interesting. No, what I have said was... <laughs> This is a job for a lawyer, thinks Steve Bacon. <laughs> the role of an MP is not to go to Ottawa and read half-baked questions and question period. And a lot of people relate to me when I say that. You know, there are a lot of opposition MPs who stand up and read questions. It sounds like they've never even read it through the first time. Someone else has written it for them. They read it, they post it on their YouTube channel, and it feels like, oh, is that their contribution? Is that amounting to anything? What's quite important to know is that the um, official opposition, it makes a difference in the way uh, Parliament functions. I mean, it, it's true what Adriana says, there has to be a measure of party discipline. Both parties uh, operate on that basis. But uh, the opposition can actually... When you have no answers, you may as well screw up properly. It's not just a matter of, of opposing. So two really good recent examples. One is the uh, Aboriginal education motion that is, uh, was unanimously adopted in the House that basically said we have to stop having uh, discriminatory education funding for on-reserve um, Aboriginal kids. That was an NDP motion. The government agreed to it, and now their feet is to the fire about delivering on it legislatively or policy-wise. Yeah, that, that would have been taken care of if the Kelowna Accord had gone through. And the second Just example is the... Uh, this party didn't cancel Kelowna, though. No, we didn't. Uh, uh, well, they helped cancel. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Canadian... They, 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 they got together... By pulling the parliament down, you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Canadian, uh, the Canadian people voted out a government that was scandal-ridden, and uh, that's what happened. In, oh, come on, Craig. It was scandal... Absolutely scandal. Okay, it was scandal-ridden. We're but talking let's about the, the, the Liberals of 2006. All right, now we're going to spend some time talking about the scandals of po politics. Yeah, the 2006 election, some of what happened was that there was an investigation by the RCMP, and this was broken open in the middle of an election, which is, I mean, the Elections Canada should have intervened and said this is absolutely not fair, uh, because it, it really interfered with the election. That had a lot to do with who the, who, who the Canadians voted for. Can I bring this out, though, into a larger subject, which is, yeah. let's never mind of the election of 2006. Let's talk about the fact that, I think probably with the exception of your party, because nobody's found it, uh, <coughs> nobody's got squeaky clean virginal hands here, if I can put it that way. You know, the, the Conservatives are on the hot seat right now about their robocalls. Uh, the Liberals had to confess the other day, their member for Guelph admitted that he made some calls that probably crossed the line. Uh, you know, the New Democrats have been known in their day to get their elbows up and play some brass knuckle politics as well. Yes, yeah. everybody's done it. If you, if you want to give some really good examples, it's about not, not as... people voting in elections, I think, you know, yeah. listen, there's... there's, yeah. there's let's, just, let's just say... There's no virgins let, here at this table. That's uh, what I'm trying to say. Let's just keep uh, the the recent problems of electoral politics in the hands where they belong, the Liberals and the Conservatives. If you can find anything that the NDP has been doing, I'm welcome to it. What? Good answer. P Pakin tried to lump the NDP in, in with the same crookedness as the other two that have been exposed. Wasn't it? Wasn't a good shot. Go ahead. You got anything? Uh, I think there was something in the paper this morning, wasn't there? Isn't there an issue brewing? In a riding uh, in Toronto? Uh, uh, maybe. It's just talk points. It it's, has absolutely nothing to do with any reality at all, right? So, you want to be more specific about that? Let's talk. Uh, I think there are allegations at this point. Let's ah, talk. so he can't prove anything. Talk about the future. Let's talk about this riding. <laughs> Let's talk about the future. What can you say about the future when you don't have any answers? You know, we are, none of us. What you want the future to be like is responsible for any of that okay, stuff. But, so, but fair enough. You know, I, I, but one of the things I that's big gonna, in the you news what, right you now. Wanted, Craig wanted an example. I'll give you an example because it, it relates to our writing. Ah. And it was um, a few years ago um, there was an NDP meeting and it was supposed to be on parliamentary funds and it was supposed to be about the environment, which is big in our writing. And a lot of NGOs were invited to it and it turned out that it was an NDP fundraiser. 
which is absolutely wrong. And we contacted a lot of the NGOs and said, do you realize this is an NDP fundraiser? And my understanding was that it was using parliamentary funds as outreach to voters, and it ended up being an NDP fundraiser. I, didn't, I never asked to have that investigated, but those kinds of things... Oh, she never asked to have it investigated. Whew. Why not? Because it's a little ambiguous, you know? How informed were they that this NDP meeting was going to be using the money they brought in for NDP functions? You should have complained. Maybe you'd find out if you're right. That's, that's one specific example that I know of, but those kinds of things... Well, that's really a cheap shot. ...go on all the time. Again, I mean, any party that's in power tends to, tends to manipulate things that way. I have no idea about that, so... That's right, he's never been in power. Maybe he has NDP in that writing. I know, well, and, and I, I'm not, you know, I'm not but, criticizing you. I'm just saying that that, that kind of thing happened. The point is, I'm not, we're not seeing that in this election, and that's and that's exactly what we want. The one thing we know that the NDP had to do a climb down on was that a lot of the money they raised that was related to Jack Layton's death, mm -hmm. they gave that money to the, I think, to the Broadband Institute, and then, or they they had to give the money, I think, to the Broadband Institute because they realized that they raised it in such a way mm -hmm. that was. Illegal otherwise. So they, so they avoided committing a crime. Good for them. Had to rethink that. I'm not sure anybody was charging malice aforethought, but that's, <laughs> they ended up having to climb down on that. Anyway, bottom line, we don't have a Conservative time. candidate here today. I want to remind everybody who tuned in late, the Conservatives have declined to participate today. Have they been on any of your neighborhood they all candidates? They were in the first race? one. In the very first one? Yeah, but one not since the second one as well? The second, the one school one. One of the school one. as well. One of the, one of yeah, yeah. I wasn't invited to the school one. Okay, so the schools are teaching their kids that in our democracy, you don't get to hear all your choices. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Keyes is a very mild-mannered, nice guy. I wish he joined us for the rest. You know why? Well, I terrorized them last time with the war criminal stuff and the BC baby death tripling, you know? <laughs> is uh, No, I don't actually. Okay. <laughs> is political ethics an issue that you're finding at the door? Oh yes, I would say so. People are bringing uh, it up. Uh, absolutely, um, and uh, the, the latest issue of the massive uh, fraudulent calling is something people are bringing up. But Grant also brought up in one of our other uh, debates that there is a de degree of disaffection with uh, with politics more generally, and so you hear versions of that as well, for sure. We're what so. Forty percent of uh, eligible voters in Canada don't vote. It's higher in our riding, not lower, and it's mostly young people. They're feeling disengaged, uh, disenfranchised, disaffected, whatever the dis word you want to use is. And uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to young people who said, you guys are full of BS, you're all liars, I can't stand watching the news on TV, get out of my face. And no... Who can blame them, right? After watching this, the guy doesn't have an answer and he wants to talk to you and have you tell him your problems so he can add them to his list of problems he's aware of. <laughs> Those are the people I want to talk to. They're the, my favorite people in the world. And Do you believe this? He likes talking to people who say, get out of my face, you're a liar with no answers, you can't help me. I love talking to those kind of people, he says. <laughs> I hope I can reel them back into participating. I don't even care who they vote for. Go ahead. What would you say? I, but can I finish this? What, what? I don't care who they vote for. I just know that if they all did vote, vote, Stephen Harper wouldn't be in power. Bull, the same percentage who get hypnotized to the adults to vote blue, out of the kids are going to vote blue, like their daddy, and the reds, and the browns. So, don't believe that the kids are that disaffected with the blues, because a bunch of them are trained to vote blue. Well, one of the more interesting things red. is, is <laughs> and I have to agree with with Grant, it's extremely uh, important that we have engagement or re-engagement with youth. Um, and that's one of the exciting things I do find in the writing. I think the writing is, is uh, at least on, in terms of those who have been engaging with us during this campaign. Yesterday we had uh, 45,000 pieces of literature that we wanted to get out to every house in one day. And uh, we had... Any good ideas on the piece of literature? <laughs> and, uh, kids coming in from all across Ontario, including uh, Brampton. We oh, had, uh, organization! Kids from all the different schools. In, Enthusiasm! Uh, uh, the riding, organizing their friends. It was absolutely amazing. Passing and out so his name. The kind of energy I'm seeing <laughs> is is uh, provide some optimism, frankly, uh, about that, and one has to build on it.
Okay, let me ask you all, I know none of you is running for Toronto City Council, you're all running for the federal <laughs> parliament. However, I think it's also fair to say that perhaps the biggest issue in this city today, subways or LRTs, and I'd like to know where you all come down on that. What's your view? Um, subways or LRTs. Uh, subways are actually the most economical, um, but only where there's the density to support it. Is there the density to support it across Eglinton into Scarborough? Mm -hmm. No. There is not. There is not. So you I mean, I, I, I think that everybody knows that, that that proposed subway law. Now, if you took the interest out of the contracts, probably could. I will never pay for itself. So you disagree Something. with Mayor Ford on this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, right. I think... I'm a, uh, so I, I, I have two, two opinions on this. First of all, I... <laughs> two opinions. I think that um, the federal government should be a partner and invest as much as they possibly can in transit. Uh, it will result in a huge reduction in carbon emissions. Absolutely. Um, and it will make our lifestyles much better. And we'll have cleaner air in our cities. And, you know, we'll get a return on the investment in our in improved health. So, if only we could afford it. But if we have the federal government and the province and the city all trying to, you know, argue their way into, you know, uh, influencing yes. what we do in this city, That's right. it'll just be a quagmire. And today it's a mess. I think the, gov the federal government should trust the city and the province to figure out that the most efficient way to move the largest number of people with the greatest return on investment. Uh, he's in favor so of the best. Personally, I think the federal government should stay out of it. Um, Stephen Harper was here the other day and he it, said that very thing. Exactly. He said but, it's not my decision. But, I'm not. I, I that's actually, right. My opinion, I like Let's spend a lot of time on an issue that the federal government isn't involved with. Further, faster. A Steve Pagan specialty. It's 50 kilometers of LRT <laughs> and 25 of, of subway, and the subway's not in the, in the, the most efficient so place. You so. would also oppose Rob Ford's plan then? I would. Okay. Greg, your position? Well, I'm, I'm in favor of Transit City, and I, b I believe it's a sign of a uh, reinvigorating democracy that City Council has been pushing back the way they have. Uh, I can't disagree with both points about uh, why transit is so important environmentally for health, but also for productivity. Uh, the more gridlock you get, the more downtime you have yeah, for people yeah, yeah. and their businesses. And we their need better. Yeah, yeah. Even things that seem like a small thing, which is actually getting from childcare to school to your workplace and trying to manage all that as a young family. We need better. Transit. And you get a lot of frustrated people in this city uh, oh, with respect yeah. to transit uh, gridlock uh, and car gridlock. So uh, so he knows the problem and he'd like a solution. I, I, I honestly think that uh, <laughs> Transit City has been thought through. It has the idea of healthy communities at the center of it, not just uh, funding, but also the fact that we actually don't have the funds that uh, Mayor Ford thinks we have. Is and, of course, not understanding how bonds could be the funds necessary to do that, he's limited and cannot do it and admits his failure. Part of a more prudential approach. When uh, Prime Minister Harper was here the other day with Jim Flaherty and Mayor Ford making an announcement down on the waterfront, he was asked, subways or streetcars, LRTs, and he said subways. So he st stayed on Mayor Ford's side on that one. Uh, however, when asked do you have a role in this? He said, no, this is right. for the province and the city to work out. Do you agree that there's no role for the federal government here? Uh, I think that uh, the federal... Not unless they stick their nose in it and make one. Government should set some guidelines. Oh, we do guidelines. Need, it, uh, it should be something that reduces emissions. It should be cost effective. To me, another very big third priority, and that has to do with a lot of what's happening in Toronto Danforth, is there has to be public input. Uh, one, of, one of the flaws that I... Public input, just to have public input. I found with, with Transit City is that it was kind of imposed on our riding. We are already becoming the graveyard for all, of, all transit storage for the entire city. It was just thrown on us. Um, I, I, you know, more adequate discussion with people about how things work, even in terms of safety. We're, we're now... Yes, we, we need more discussion. Building um, streetcar... Uh, uh, the streetcar yards will lead up Leslie and conf conflict directly with hundreds of postal trucks traveling that route, and there's been a number of fatalities. That could have been flushed out before they just decided that that's where it's going to go. Well, there's absolutely a role for uh, for the federal at the federal level for uh, not as urban uh, public transit. Uh, What's the role? 
Well, the role has to do with the degree of stable funding. If, if it's against <laughs> state funding, the NDP has proposed okay. one cent off the gas tax to actually go to urban transit, and also incentive schemes for employers to actually get their money back in the tax system if they're actually paying for the transit passes and other things of, of their employees. Those are, are ultimately fairly modest things, but put into the scheme of a broader national transit strategy, such as Olivia Chow has been proposing, there is a role, but it's a... Yeah, very modest. <laughs> bus passes. Provincial, federal, Tax expense for bus passes. Cooperation, Grant was talking about this correctly. Sure, the sure. Cooperation and coordination is part of it, but the feds can't vacate the field. Mm -hmm. So we need to trust that the city is going to get the best experts they can possibly find on transit, the best engineers, and come up with a solution. Obviously, the federal government, there has to be some checks and balances you know, attached to a check. But I don't think they should be really sticking their nose in there and saying you have to do it this way because our experts say you should. Um, there, there, there has to be trust in the, in the local government to know the city best. One of the things the Harper government has offered is a tax break. If you use the transit system a lot. You in favor of that? Outstanding. You like that idea? Yeah. How about you? Absolutely. Or, you know, free transit passes for employees, making that making that uh, tax deductible. I mean, there are federal uh, tax breaks for providing uh, cars to employees. You know, really, if, if you're going to give those kinds of tax breaks, why not fund transit passes? Why not fund, fund, fund bicycles? Well, they give they tax should, breaks for transit passes. I want to find out if you're on side with that, too, though. Sure, and, and absolutely, in this generality, and also the particular issue of, of uh, tax credits for actually helping your employees use public transit. Can I just understand this? You three agree with the Harper government's position to give tax breaks for people to ride a subway? Absolutely. Yeah, because it's little stuff. It's not like a mortgage break. The everything wrong. <laughs> okay, you, you've all agreed with one thing Stephen Harper's done here. We've got that on record. Yeah. Yes? Yes. So, on the little stuff they can agree on, right? It's like it, okay. Yes. You want to do ad, though? No, that's no, it. That's it, okay. <laughs> All right, good. Let's talk some politics here, gang. Craig, if you win, well, even if you don't win, you're going to have a say in who the next leader of the federal NDP is. Who should it be? Oh, who oh. cares? Ah. Oh. Unless we're not decided. Come on. No, seriously. We've got a week left, you know. Well, actually, I'm only going to have two or three days because after the, the by-election, I'm going to give myself two days to actually put together a lot of the pieces that have been fragmented. I've been focusing on nothing but this by-election. There are four or five candidates who are still right on my radar screen. And uh, one of the most important things... Which aren't? That, uh, this has actually been a process that's brought a lot of talent to the surface. And when you're paying enough attention to see that talent, you don't decide quickly and easily. That's my perspective. So I haven't decided. I'll be voting on the 24th like everybody else. Who's in the mix for you? Which one aren't? <laughs> <laughs> Who's in the mix? Who is it? You know? Seven people running, so you yeah. said four of them are in the, are in the so you've ruled out three already, so who's in the mix? Who are the three of who aren't? I'd rather yeah. not say. Oh, oh, don't God. become a politician already. We haven't even got to March 19th. I'm no, coming after you next. Just wait, Brad. Yeah, I know. I, 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 he can talk about the fact that you're going to have a leadership race in 2014, only a year before. Uh, I'll get to him. Just, just don't worry about him. I'll, I'll, I'm yeah. still working on you. you know, it's quite obvious that uh, uh, folks who've done extremely well in the last little while and that are on everybody's radar screen include uh, uh, Mulcair. Ah, he fell for uh, it. He started and, naming names. Uh, Nathan Cullen. Two. Nikki Ashton has impressed incredibly. Um, so these are just three examples of people who are uh, ready. We have to keep in mind the level of French. And so uh, Peggy Nash and Brian Topp also have. Oh, so Paul Dewar's out there. Paul, French isn't really he's a uh, Paul <laughs> would pick up the French. I do believe he would pick up the French. The question is whether the membership... This is really important to the Toronto Danforth riding back. Paul uh, Dewar's French. <laughs> he has picked up support from four Quebec MPs, or two at the moment. I think there might be two others. And how his race is doing. His French is good. <laughs> so they're talking uh, about the Toronto Danforth race, race, horse race. So and now they're talking about the factor. NDP it's race. A factor and oh, the liberal race coming very, up too, I suppose. To say to folks, give me some time. But the others who are ready are the ones I listed in terms of French. I'm interested that you haven't mentioned Brian Topp's name. Oh, but another one down. All right. Speaks French. No, Brian. Brian as well, of course. <laughs> So he's on your list as yeah. well. Oh, okay, he's so okay. You didn't mention him. 
Jesus. It wasn't intentional. Okay, that's just a, wanted to clarify that. Get it funny. Okay, your okay, turn now. Bring it, bring it. Here we go. <laughs> the uh, so-called interim leader of your party is Bob yes. Ray. Yes, yes, yes. A lot yes. of people think he's not that interim. What's your view on whether Bob Ray should lead your party into the next federal election? Me and Bob Ray go back a long way. Well, my view is, first of all, he is uh, doing a remarkable job. Once sued him for slander, made him pay his lawyer 3000 bucks. John, and I think there are a lot of people who would agree with me. I'm hearing it in our riding an awful lot. He is, uh, he's really the unofficial leader of the opposition. The media goes to him right after Stephen Harper. Uh, and it's very noticeable. <laughs> the failed NDP leader is a good liberal leader. <laughs> that would be articulate and very wise. And I think he's doing a phenomenal job. Uh, do I think he should be the automatic leader of the party? No. I didn't say automatic, but do you think no. he should be the leader? I think, I don't know who else is running, so right now I do. Is there anybody out there you would prefer to him as the next leader of the party? Uh, not presently. I don't know who would be interested in the job right now, anyway. Well, we know the names that are out there. Well, I think, I think there's probably a breadth of talent we're not aware of as well. But he took the job, if I recall, under the condition that he not run for the permanent position. <laughs> That's his understanding of it. He's never forsworn any desire to run for the job. He hasn't said yeah. he hasn't said sure, he sure. not answer the question at all. Do you think he needs to make absolutely abundantly clear that he has no intention of running for the permanent position? I think, uh, do he, does he need to make that abundantly clear now? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I mean, he said at the beginning, I'm not going to run. Um, there may be a, a lot of people who beg him to run. The constitution of the party could be changed. Gee, and if a majority want him to run, how can he say no? <laughs> and a that, socialist to lead the liberals. How would you be content with that? His running? Yeah. Absolutely. You would. Absolutely. Okay. Ah, it doesn't matter if he breaks his promise to this guy. Your turn. <laughs> yeah. Not everybody's thrilled with Elizabeth May. You think she... I should love to have Bob Ray as the leader of the ND, I mean the Liberals. You should lead the party into the next federal election? Yeah, I do. I think she's great. And I think most people in this riding really love her. Which is why, uh, <laughs> which is why one of the, my, my competitors here actually wants to pretend that she, he has her endorsement. And I love the fact that, I mean, if you want another green like Elizabeth May, that's me. It's really nobody else. Okay, that's but I do that think... I didn't I, get. Uh, explain that reference? <laughs> he endorsed, he's got Elizabeth May's endorsement? No, he does not. Me, <laughs> but I do want to, I do want to just say uh, well, that I, I, I find it really that. funny. I do <laughs> find it really funny that... Uh, that right now what we've got is two parties each saying we're really the best opposition and you've got uh, a liberal, neither of them have a leader at the moment. The liberal party's probable coming leader is a new democrat. <laughs> and the new Who's Dem that? Bob Ray. Bob Ray? The yeah. new democratic probable leader is a liberal. Mulcair. <laughs> Mulcair from Quebec, yes. And, uh, and, yeah. and, well, and a liberal who toyed with being a conservative <laughs> and an interim leader who's a separatist. That's not true. That's pretty funny. You know, it does show there's really no difference between them. <laughs> that's that's, 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 that's a complete, complete, We're going to clarify no, all that. Let's, let's, let's clarify all Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's very important for the sake of... What do we do is explain the background? Very quickly. Explain the background. No, no. The, the claim that uh, Mr. Mulcair flirted with being a Tory, no. He flirted with uh, assuming a position on the environment. All right. Back and forth. Liberal NDP, no difference. But a Tory? No. <laughs> after he resigned in principle from the Liberal government of Quebec. There's nothing in the record to suggest that he was flirting with the Tories. No, they approached him. The exactly. So I think it's really important that people listening to this do not get that impression. Let's come back to, let's come back to this. And, but before I say anything, I want to say, Elizabeth May, uh, I completely admired her when she supported Stéphane Dion's green shift. <laughs> I completely admired for that. She wanted cap and trade. She knows it's the only way. She does not. No, 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 she, no, no, no. Well, in, in terms Sorry, of... Sorry, Dion, Dion, Dion had a carbon tax, not a cap and trade mechanism. Either way, they want to charge us for a hoax. Burning more coal just means we're going to have more trees. Start. Say, well, virtually very similar. No, they're not very well, similar. They they're actually quite a, quite a bit different. They put a price on carbon. And you can argue till you're blue in the face which one is going to have more of an impact. No, you can't. But you can't. If you talk to the experts, if you talk to the let's just go back. Did, 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 they, did they endorse you or not? No. Did, no, and so I never said she endorsed. So what are you referring? But to? I just wanted to say something nice about her because I think she's great. She 
They, she knew that Stefan Dion's green shift was progressive, and it was going to She's also great because she listened to the liberal <laughs> carbon emissions very quickly in this country if it had gone into effect. And I admire her for putting aside her party and saying, I agree with that. It's the right thing for the environment. The NDP did not agree with it. And I thought that was a tragedy. And then your party now, abandoned it. Now, so what's the... <laughs> <laughs> but they proposed it, even though they abandoned it. <laughs> no, you now, won't. You're going to vote along with your leader, whatever he no, says. No, 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 no. Now you listen, can't. so listen to the new you Liberal Party. So listen to this. So uh, when, I, when I won the nomination, I said... I, proposed an idea. Oh. It would have He had an idea. <laughs> okay if I wrote all my oh. campaign literature and designed it. And the party said, sure, we believe in your values. We know that you align well with the liberal, your small L values. Liberal values align very well with your, with the capital L liberals. Oh. And uh, go for it. And I really want it to be authentic. I wanted to express. <laughs> he wanted to be an authentic small L and capital L liberal. <laughs> self, on the page, the way I speak, everything I feel. I saw it. It was very clever. Well, thank you. Thank you. So I did slip in. I like to be cheeky. I like to have it fun. It was very cheeky. Yeah. Well, that's that's kind Go of. What take it, take thirty seconds and explain cheeky. what it said. Okay, so it said I I was listing on one of the panels, kind of my background and the people I've worked with, and. Elizabeth May once said that I was a creative genius. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure that I always am, and my wife would definitely not agree with that comment, but I thought it would be cheeky to put it in. She's a former TV host, so I agree with her. Uh, anyway, keep going. <laughs> and so, uh, and I've worked with Elizabeth in the past. We did some very successful projects together, and I thought it would be cheeky to put it in. I, in no way does it say that she's endorsed me. She's obviously endorsed you. You're an important part of her party, I'm sure. So let's okay. just get it. Okay. <laughs> so we just spent a lot of time on how cheeky was his advertising. With two and a half minutes to go here, I want to ask you each one more question. You think there's going to be anything of substance? Has Steve Pakin thought of something important that's going to help the voters of Toronto Danforth cope with the squeezing that they're suffering? Tell us, Steve, what's important? The fact is the Conservatives have a majority in Ottawa right now, so the result of this by-election won't change that at all. That's they good. would bill the day after this by-election takes place. So some people could conclude as a result, it doesn't really matter who wins this by-election, it's not going to be them, we know that. Well, what if I ever got in? <laughs> won this writing in 50 years. Of course, Steve doesn't ever think about anybody else but the three boring or four boring candidates he's going to talk to. It doesn't really matter which one of you wins it. You're right. Absolutely no difference which of those wins it. <laughs> Nothing changes. Craig first, explain to people why it matters that the NDP takes this as opposed to one of the other two parties. And the Green earlier said that it didn't matter because they were all going to have to cooperate, remember? Well, basically because the NDP is positioned to actually remain and act as the official opposition in the way I've been talking about and set things up to make us an attractive alternative for 2015. And I'm a candidate that actually can help that. It's a strong team, but I'm also going oh. to be a strong actor in, in Parliament. Vote for me so that my win will help us win next time. Even though you don't have any answers. <laughs> writing, uh, Winning is always after. Strong representation. Uh, Jack set a very high bar and uh, the expectations are high. And so I'm hoping that people will see that as part of what they want to do. Why does it matter that the Liberals take it as opposed to the Greens or the NDP? Uh, two things. I'm not sure I agree with what you're saying, Craig. Um, Bob Ray seems to be leading the charge in Ottawa. I think there's... Uh, Grant, you're running I, here, not Bob. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear, though. Um, I think it's really important we have someone who goes to Ottawa and represents the voice of the riding. Uh, but I also think there are a lot of problems in her. He wants to represent the voice, either baritone, tenor. <laughs> there are children going to school hungry. There is youth unemployment. Oh, he knows the problems. He made a list. <laughs> Tell us again. Uh, new Canadian families who are really upset about the cuts and they're not sure how to get help. We need someone, a maverick in the riding, who creates programs who oh. tries to bring the community together to, to build it. And a I, guy who creates programs to build it. 
I think we can solve our own problems until 2015. At least we can solve some of them. We need ideas. We need a fresh voice. We need someone rallying people together. I need to say 30 seconds. We need ideas means he ain't got any yet. It's for Adrian. <laughs> Still I looking. That, uh, it doesn't really matter if the other parties get another seat. It would make a huge difference to Canada, to our children, yeah, yeah, to the same if we got another You can speak, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I would be able to speak out in our riding, for our riding, like no, none of the other parties could, as somebody who comes from a party that demands a bigger voice. Imagine someone new. Wouldn't that be different? As somebody who comes from a party that really does respect that old parliamentary tradition of diverse voices, <laughs> I can speak out on every bill. I can put forward amendments. None of And so could I. These others can, as backbenchers. I introduced you all in alphabetical order, and I will say thank you to all of you in alphabetical order. Grant Gordon, who's representing the Liberals in Toronto Danforth, Adriana Munyato Hamu, the Green Party of Canada in Toronto Danforth, Craig Scott, representing the New Democrats in Toronto Danforth. A reminder, we invited the Conservative candidate to be here. He declined our invitation. And a reminder that Steve Pakin did not invite me or any of the other alternative idea candidates to make sure that he'd have a show with nothing new and that he could cope. Because this is not a guy who copes with new stuff. I told him about the Argentine solution way back in the early 1980s and uh, he never caught on then, so who's going to expect him to catch on now? Thanks to all of you and uh as we say to the good uh, people in Toronto Danforth, and as they say in Cook County, Chicago, vote early, vote often. Good luck. <laughs> vote early, vote often for the crooks in Cook County, Chicago, from a crook who ran a crooked debate, Steve Pakin. TVO. The not all candidates debate. To all of you on Monday. Thanks. Mm. And joining us now on the debate, Stop. the major party candidates for the Toronto Danforth by-election in alphabetical